Okay, so uh, the constraints, of course, uh, in this lecture is to talk about large scale limits of what was the title? Interacting particle systems. And actually, I will talk more specifically about the case of uh, dilute gases. Of course, I will explain what, what it means to be a dilute gases. And actually, uh, I will be uh, even more uh, precise, and I will look at a situation close to equilibrium. So it's not... Uh, some equilibrium statistical physics because uh, we'll have some dynamics, but still we will be close to equilibrium. Okay, so uh, actually this is part of a very uh, huge program that uh, uh, we are working on with um, uh, Thierry Bodino, Isabel Gallagher, and Sergio. And so this program actually is uh, now quite, um, so we have been working on this program since a couple of years, so there, there, there is a lot of material and I would like to tell you a lot of things, but I will try to be a bit organized and to just focus on some uh, uh, main uh, important ideas. Of course, if you have questions or if something is too fast or okay, too technical, you just uh, should stop me and uh, I will try to explain a bit uh, more precisely bit uh, better. Okay, so that's... Um, um, and to start with, I will try to give you just uh, uh, the big picture of this program, and then uh, I will uh, try really to insist on some ingredients of the proof. I will not explain everything, but just uh, very important ideas. Okay, so, um, so the, the, um, the whole program is about the sixth problem of Hilbert. And this problem is about uh, the axiomatization of physics, okay? And especially in the case of gas dynamics. So in the case of gas dynamics, essentially uh, we have, say, three levels of models. Okay, so the first level of model is just uh, the ato atomic level. So here, that, that will be actually our starting point. You just have this uh, interacting particle. Just assume that your gas is constituted of a lot of atoms, and these atoms are just interacting uh, together. And so you can just write Newton's equation for this system of particles. Okay, so here you have Newton equations. Okay, so that's the starting point, and say uh, at the very end, what you would like to understand if is uh, you can uh, say use some macroscopic model for your gas. So fluid models, of course, they are the the models that you can use. For instance, if you would like to compute, I don't know, uh, the flight of uh, a plane or things like this. Of course, you will not uh, compute uh, the motion of all atoms in the air. Okay, it's just impossible. So here you would like to have fluid models. So we can think, for instance, about, say, Navier-Stokes equation, Fourier. Okay, and the question by Hilbert was to understand this connection here. But actually, it suggested part of the solution of this problem by saying that in the case of gases, so Gases, say, by definition, they are a system where, say, the particles have kind of weak interaction, okay? So they are uh, small particles and a lot of vacuum, and the interactions are, are, uh, are say, essentially uh, weak. And so it suggested that maybe you can have an intermediate uh, level of description using kinetic theory. and especially the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so the question is to uh, have this connection here. And actually, maybe it's uh, simpler to do something like this. Okay, so now I will explain how you uh, get this transition here. So this transition here, of course, 
here you have a completely deterministic system with a lot of particles. And here you see that the phase space is uh, actually much smaller because you just would like to understand the, the, the motion of one typical particle. Okay, so here you have n particles. And here, typically what you have is one typical particle. Okay, so here this is just a statistical description. Okay, and that's essentially uh, the, the part that uh, I will uh, focus on in the sequel. Okay, so here this is a statistical description. And so, of course, you see that if you would like to have a statistical description which is meaningful, then you need to have n which goes to infinity. Okay, but then that's the point where we have this assumption of dilute gas. Okay, so. Um, we will see that we have to scale, of course, also the interaction potential, okay? And so probably in this, uh, in this conference, there will be different ways of scaling uh, the interaction. So one which is very well known is min field. So min field means that you have your n particles, but then you, s you, you, you expect the, 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 the strength of the interaction to be uh, very small, like 1 over n. Okay, so that's essentially uh, the total force is of the order of, of one. Here is different. What you assume is that somehow the, the range of the interaction potential is very small. Okay, so essentially you will not see all the particles, but just your neighbors. Okay, so that's really important here. So uh, what I will be interested in, in this low density limit, so meaning that, say, when you see a particle, the, the, the force is really of order one, so you will be deflected of uh, so your velocity will really jump, okay? But essentially you, you will not see a lot of particles just because you have very you have very short range interactions. So I will I will explain a bit more this this low density and the precise scaling, but that's really important that uh, this this Boltzmann equation tells you something about uh, dilute gases and not about any, so for instance, for plasma, it's not the, the right description. Okay, and then you have this, 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 uh, this other uh, transition here that I will not really uh, describe in details, but I just wanted to um, tell you one word about, say, uh, in which limits you get this transition here, because it's important to understand that uh, the result that we uh, already know on this transition here are not enough to understand the whole picture. Okay, so what you obtain here is so that's what is called a fast relaxation limit, meaning that essentially you so in this kinetic theory in the Boltzmann equation, essentially you describe two phenomena. So one is uh, transport. Okay, particles are transported. So you have transport and you have collisions. Okay, so sometimes particles just collide and then they are deflected. Okay? And then you see that uh, this fast relaxation limit means that actually you have a lot of collisions before you are transported. Okay, so that locally you expect your gas to be at thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so locally the gas is at thermodynamic equilibrium. And then you see that if it's at thermodynamic equilibrium, then you can describe this gas just by a couple of macroscopic parameters. Okay, so essentially the density, the bulk velocity, and the temperature. Okay, and then you see that you have equation for this, so this fluid equations just govern the, the evolution of this, this macroscopic parameters here. Okay, and so you see that what is important is that it's a fast relaxation limit. Okay, so somehow you have that the collision process is much faster than the transport. Okay, so you would like to see a lot of collisions. Okay, so that's really important. Okay, so uh, say the Knudsen number, which goes to zero. But the Knudsen number is essentially uh, the ratio between the mean free pass and the typical length say, the observation lengths. 
And this has to be really, really small. Okay, so you see that the, the problem with this is that you have to see a lot of collisions, but we will see that actually this transition here in general is justified only for a few collisions, actually a fraction of the typical mean free path, uh, mean free uh, time. Okay, so that's really uh, a problem because you see that if you have just this result for short time, then it's just impossible to combine with results here for uh, agrodynamic limits. Okay, so that's really one point which is important, and that's why I will here describe the situation close to equilibrium, because close to equilibrium we will be able to justify this transition here for long times. Okay, so that's maybe I can just uh, uh, redo this this um, this picture close to equilibrium because it will be actually much better, and I will tell you uh, exactly what say which models I will consider for each levels of description. Okay, but we will see that actually this picture is completely justified in this case close to equilibrium. Okay, so that's um, now the same thing but close to equilibrium because we will have uh Okay, so let me uh, start with the, uh, the uh, atomic model. So here I will really uh, take the simplest possible model just assuming that I have a gas of uh, um, are spheres, meaning that your particles are just spheres. They, they are transported uh, with uh, rectilinear uh, uniform motion until they collide. And then you have uh, what is called a, a specular reflection, elastic reflection, meaning that when two particles collide, both the energy and the momentum are conserved. Okay, so here I will start with art spheres. Elastic collision. Recording in progress. Okay, so elastic collision once again is is that uh, you have that if two particles say uh, with velocity v and v1 collide, then you should have this two relation here. Okay, and then you see that essentially you have only one possible uh, collision law. Okay, if you have two particles like this colliding, okay, imagine that they arrive with velocity v and v1 here. Okay, then you have that, so the vector n is just x minus x, x1 uh, divided by the modulus of x minus x1. Okay, and then you have uh, the law that v prime will be v minus v minus v1 dot n times n and v prime 1 is equal to v1 plus v minus v1 dot n n. Okay, and n is just x minus x1 divided by x minus x1. Okay, so that's the collision law and say apart from the, the, the moment where they collide, you just have that the velocity is constant and x is just uh, uh, dx divided by dt equal to v. Okay, so that's okay. So I have this big uh, system uh, of R spheres with uh, with this elastic collision, and of course the number of particles here will go to infinity. So I have this this number of particles, and also I don't know very precisely uh, the distribution of. So I I don't know exactly, and I'm not interested in the um, uh, the precise localization or precise uh, configuration of all these particles, but what I know at time zero is just a kind of probability density on this big phase space. Okay, so essentially here you have some randomness at time zero on the initial data. Yeah, because essentially what you say is that if you observe the gas, what you can really measure is something like a density for a typical particle, but you cannot really measure or observe the configuration of all particles or the, the joint uh, probability of all particles. Okay, so essentially you will choose the initial data here to be compatible with this, this observable, which is just the density of the of one particle. Okay, so essentially what you will assume here is that the particles are 
IID at time zero. Of course, it's not completely true that they are IID. They cannot be completely independent just because they have to. Uh, they they cannot overlap. Okay, so essentially you have. So independent is not correct. It's actually independent up to the exclusion. Okay. And uh, identically distributed particles. Does it, does it mean you start with the Gibbs distribution? So I will just explain right now. Yeah. So in general, there is no reason. So if, if I just would like to answer this problem, there is no reason to start with the Gibbs measure. I can take any uh, distribution for the typical self the typical distribution of one particle, I can t take any uh, distribution. But here I will, uh, since I, I want to be at equilibrium, I, I will look at this Gibbs measure, OK? OK, so here it's, that's exactly what we do. And actually, there is still one, one uh, thing about the randomness and the initial data. So I will uh, first have this randomness on the uh, uh, distribution, so in x and v, but I will also have some randomness in the number of particles. Actually, what I know is not the exact number of particles, but just the average number of particles. And I, I will have something like a quasi-Poisson law, okay, which is called uh, actually a grand canonical setting. So mu, which is the average uh, number of particles per unit of volume. okay. So that's um, number of particles per unit of volume. So this mu is fixed, but the, num the number of particles is not fixed. Okay, and so essentially I will start with a Gibbs measure, which has this form. So here I have the partition function, which is the, just a normalization. OK, then I have mu to the um, n divided by factorial n. And the mu actually will depend on epsilon. OK, and then I take uh, the Gibbs measure. So the Gibbs measure is just exponential minus uh, the energy. So the energy of the system is just the sum of all velocities to the square. One to n divided by 2. OK, I can. OK, that's the case with temperature equal to 1, of course can just change the temperature here. And then I have, uh, of course, you see that. So this, this would be exactly the case of independent uh, uh, initial uh, data, because here this is just a product here. But of course, I cannot take this product because of the exclusion. So I have to uh, multiply this by uh, this, the indicator function here of this domain. And this domain is just the fact that xi minus xj has to be uh, um, uh, bigger than epsilon. Okay, so that's that's the the, the initial uh, measure. So, what is the new epsilon? so I will just explain. So n n is a is a random variable here. It's the number of particles. Okay, and I will take all possibilities. So my phase space is actually. And the mu epsilon is this, this uh, average number of particles. And now you see that I, I have to look this system in this low density limit. And so mu epsilon will be, uh, it will be actually uh, related to the size epsilon of the particles here. OK. And so the size of the particles, so here I assume that the size, this diameter is epsilon. OK. And so uh, what I will uh, look at is the transition. So that's the low density limit. So mu epsilon goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero, and I have that mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one, say is equal to some alpha, and alpha will be uh, the inverse uh, mean free uh, time. So say for the moment, alpha is fixed. So maybe this is time the Lebesgue measure on the x and d. Yeah, then then it's uh, Lebesgue measure on x and so I assume that uh, I'm a to torus in x, okay? So that's uh, it's really a probability measure. Everything is integrable, 
Okay, and then in V, uh, that's uh, this, this case measure times the Lebesgue measure. Okay, and so this, this um, the fact that this is uh, just a min free time, okay, if you just uh, have a picture like this, you see that each particle here during a time one will actually describe a volume which is a cylinder. And so you see that uh, the size of, so the, the section of this cylinder is like epsilon to d minus one. The length here is the typical velocity times the time. Okay, and you would like that typically you have one collision per unit of time. So if you have mu epsilon particles, you see that this will give you exactly this scaling relation here. Okay? So that's uh, the, first, uh, the first level here. Okay, and so uh, the second level now would be, uh, so you see that it should be something like the Boltzmann equation. It should be a, an equation at the kinetic level. But um, actually, I'm close to equilibrium. So if I just look at the, um, at, uh, the empirical measure, okay, so now uh, the, the object that I would like to look at is the empirical measure. I, I will call uh, pi, uh, say, epsilon here. Okay, so that's just uh, one divided by mu epsilon, and you have the sum i equal 1 to n, and the Dirac measure at x i z i. Okay, so that's a measure which depends on t and x. So I take all particles, I put a direct measure in each time I have a particle, okay? So this, so if you are in the canonical setting, so just fixing the number of particles, you see that's just one over n times this sum here. So this is just the average of all these direct masses. And so you see that here you have a first actually uh, averaging, which is just averaging over the different levels of the particles. And now in the grand canonical setting, you have to uh, normalize this thing by one over mu epsilon, but then you still take the sum of all the direct masses. Okay, so, so if you look at this and you believe that this, this uh, scheme here is, uh, is correct, then you see that what you expect is that, and actually what Lanford's theorem tells you is that this empirical measure will concentrate when in this uh, low density limit to the solution of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, but that's not really interesting because in this case, if you start with this initial data, then uh, the Boltzmann equation has a constant solution, a stationary solution, which is just a Maxwellian. Okay, so that's okay, but okay, so that's actually it's a bit um, okay. Actually, it's a, a, a as this is an invariant measure under the dynamics, you don't really need Lanford's theorem to tell you anything about the dynamics of this this thing. It's actually uh, just physics, statistical physics at equilibrium. And you can uh, see that this empirical measure so concentrates on the solution to the Boltzmann equation. Which is just uh, this, the stationary solution, which is just exponential minus v squared divided by 2. And then you have to, uh, OK, you have some. Okay. Okay. So that's not really uh, really interesting. Of course, this is a result which is true for all times, and then but then you see that okay, you start from this 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 solution here, and then uh, the fluid model is just that uh, the solution is zero. Okay, which is okay. It's true. Okay, but it's not very interesting. Okay, so here we are not interested. So close to equilibrium, we are not really interested in this. So that's the law of large numbers. Okay, so that's the law of large numbers. Okay, so now we are interested in the next uh, correction, which would be uh, the equivalent of the central limit theorem. Okay, and so you are not interested in this empirical measure, but in the fluctuation of this empirical measure. Okay, so now we are interested in And so now this, this, this is almost the same, okay? So zeta epsilon, so, it's at, so that's p epsilon t is this measure here. And now z epsilon t is just, so 
you look at the fluctuation, so you take this empirical measure, you remove the expectation. So I just write pi epsilon because it's a bit too long. And of course, if you look at this, uh, it will just converge to zero, and then you have to rescale pi square root of mu. Okay, so that's, that part is, is essentially uh, the law of large number, but everything is at equilibrium. And now, of course, this at, this at the level of the fluctuation field, you will see something. Okay, so that the question that I'm asking here is, is it possible to prove a uh, central limit theorem? Okay, and then, so first of all, what, what can you expect in this limit? So you would like to say that if this, this picture here is very robust, then you expect that, well, this fluctuation field should satisfy an equation which looks like the linearization of this Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's a that's, uh, natural guess for this fluctuation field. But then you see that uh, there is, you are at equilibrium, so if you are a physicist, and what you expect is that because, so this linearized uh, Boltzmann equation is, is an equation which, like the Boltzmann equation, is dissipative in the sense that you have an entropy which is dissipated, okay, so which is irreversible. And now if you are a physicist, you expect that since you are equilibrium, then you should have a kind of fluctuation mechanism which compensates this, this uh, uh, dissipation. Okay, so what I say is that if I know nothing about that, okay, but I just believe that this is the correct picture, then at the level of the kinetics, or at the level of fluctuation, what, what I should see close to equilibrium is a kind of equation, a process, actually, which has to uh, satisfy an equation with two terms, one which is dissipation, which is related to this linearized Boltzmann equation, and another term, which is some noise, which actually describes all the fluctuation compensating uh, the dissipation. Okay, and that's actually what you can prove. That's the first theorem. So that's uh, with the, all these guys that I mentioned at the beginning. So with Thierry, Isabel, and Sergio, we proved this theorem that um, actually uh, there was previous result that I will uh, try to mention just after that. Okay, so what you can prove is that in the low density limit, And with this initial data, blah, 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 okay, what you expect is that the fluctuation field converts in low to the solution of the fluctuating Boltzmann equation that I will write now. Okay, so you have something like d zeta t, which is equal to L zeta t. So this is the linearized Boltzmann operator that I will uh, define right now. Plus, okay, plus a noise here, which is a Gaussian noise. Okay, and we can actually you can compute the covariance. So it's what is important here is that it's delta correlated in T and X. Okay, and what is really uh, nice in this regime is that you can prove that this convergence holds for all kinetic times and even for slightly um, diverging uh, kinetic times, so that you will be able to have this alpha here, which goes to uh, uh, 
plus infinity. Okay, so of course it has to go to plus infinity very, very slowly, but still you will be able to catch uh, some regimes where you have fast relaxation and then uh, diffusive regime and you can actually uh, get uh, the, the Stokes equation and the Fourier equation for the temperature. Okay, so, so and this, so for all kinetic times, even slowly diverging times. Okay, so that's can have alpha which goes to infinity like things like something like three log of mu epsilon. Okay. Should be like log 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 mu epsilon. So where is the time in the statement? So here, when I say that it can be uh, so either diverging times or, and that's the same because you will see a lot of, of collision, that this parameter alpha here, which is the uh, inverse of the uh, mean free time, uh, goes to infinity. Okay, essentially what I say is that uh, this, this parameter here measures the, the typical number of collision that you have per particle. Okay, so it, it, if it goes to infinity, then it's the, okay, the essentially that's, that's another way of, of counting time. Okay, so kinetic time is when this guy is one. Okay. So of course, for the moment, it's a very um, um, vague statement because I didn't define this and this. And okay, but I would like before I, I go into something more precise, I, I would like to um, make some comments. Okay. Um, so the first comment is about this noise here. Okay, so, so maybe I can. Oh, there is no. Perfect. Okay. Oh, but there are actually three, so. So the first remark is about uh, this, this noise, okay? So you see that when you start here from this, this art sphere dynamics, you see that everything is deterministic, okay? If you start from one configuration, then, okay, so you have to exclude some pathological configuration for which dynamics is not Defined, but say apart from this, you can define just one dynamics for all times. Okay, and now you see that it's really different because at this level here, you have a noise, and this is a dynamical noise. It's just not ju not just a noise on the initial data. Okay, here actually you don't have really a noise. Actually, you have a bit of noise on on the initial data, but say in this scaling, essentially you don't have any noise on the initial data. Okay, so the, the noise on the initial data will be vanishing. If you start from this, this, uh, this gift measure here, you will see that essentially at time zero, you have a, a, a bit of noise, but uh, with a scaling which uh, makes it uh, zero in the limit. Okay, so you don't have any noise at time zero, but then you see that essentially this, this microscopic noise uh, uh, on the initial data will be transferred as a dynamical noise on, the, on, the, on this fluctuation field. Okay, so that's really important because it's kind of magic. Okay, so essentially uh, the, the randomness on the initial data is transferred as a dy dynamical noise. Okay, so that, that's actually very subtle and, and so now we understand a bit better, but it's, so the geometry of this, say, the, the way it's really transferred is something which is incredibly uh, complicated because essentially it, it's encoded in very, very small structure of the initial data. Okay, so that's not something that you are really uh, able to track. Okay, so that's uh, related to um, a very, um, complicated geometrical structure in the initial data. So 
say, not really in the initial data, but really in the phase space. So it's something which is. OK, so and this, to me, seems to be related to what people uh, call uh, spontaneous stochasticity. OK, somehow what you have is something, uh, a system which is well-defined, deterministic at, at, say, for fixed epsilon here. But you see that actually two trajectories will actually uh, diverge very fast. OK, if you just change a little bit the position of one particle, you see that you can create or just make a collision disappear, and then the whole thing will be completely different. Okay, so it's not really instability because for fixed epsilon everything is sta stable, it's continuous. But you see that, say, in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, you have a lot of instability at the microscopic level, and because of thi this instability, essentially you generate this dynamical noise here. So that's probably uh, related to uh, spontaneous stochasticity. Okay, and, and really what is important here, and this is something that you don't see if you uh, are looking at the uh, mean field limit. In the mean field limit, everything is much more stable. Okay, you see that if you are in a mean field limit, you just change a bit the position of one particle. Actually, you don't care because, say, the, uh, uh, it contributes to the force field like 1 over n. Okay, so that's not really uh, a problem. Now, if you change a little bit the position of one particle in this low density regime, then you will change completely the dynamics forever. Okay, so that's really something which is uh, really important here. That's related to um, the microscopic. So instability is maybe not the right word because everything is continuous once again, but say it's not uniformly continuous, okay? With it's continuous, so if you look at the, the Lyapunov, uh, uh, so the divergence of trajectories, it's, some, it's, it's actually controlled, but with a constant which is like one over epsilon. So when epsilon goes to, inf uh, to zero, you see that you have no control. So you have this, this instability here, and then you can generate noise, okay? So that's, I think it, it's uh, something which is uh, really important. Okay, and um, okay, maybe at this stage I should write this operator here. Okay, uh, so the, the other remark was that uh, uh, one can reach very long times. Okay, so maybe I should stay uh, at this stage what was known on this, this, uh, this limit here. So actually, it, it was known uh, since the, the, the work by, uh, I think, uh, uh, probably Spohn was the, the first one to write this, 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 uh, this so part of this theorem, actually, he was able to prove that the covariance of this, this uh, field here converts to the solution of this equation, so without the noise, of course, because you just have the covariance, uh, for s short times. Okay, so, so actually, there, there, there are, so uh, first results, you just have the convergence of the covariance. For short times. OK, then, then uh, in dimension two, we had a very uh, specific results, which was for long times with Thierry and Isabelle. But it was really specific to uh, the dimension two, and it was only for the convergence of of, uh, of the covariance. So first results, uh, first result for a long time, only in dimension two. It was so essentially these two proof. So this one was a bit different, but uh, they were really uh, uh, using a land force strategy. And so you see that it's so, so this, this, this one is really land force strategy. Here, there is a bit of uh, sampling in time. So I will, I will comment on this later on. And now you see that this result is much better because you have long times and you, you also have all the, all the, uh, 
all the moments, so you prove that the, the zeta, the limiting zeta, is Cauchy. Okay, so now we have the so Cauchy t plus um, for long times. Okay, so that's so this this thing are really recent. Yeah, but what is really important here is that we can reach uh, these very long types. Okay, and that's that's what would actually allow to 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 look at this limit as well. Okay, uh, uh, maybe I will write things later on. Okay, I will define all these things later on. I just want to describe a bit the the last the last uh, step here. Okay, and then I will uh, go to more uh, precise things. Okay. Uh, there is something to. Mm. Ah, oui. One. Thanks. Okay, so maybe I can uh, just uh, remove all this. Ah, actually the third one, that's okay. So I just uh, would like to tell you how you get this, this one, but uh, then I will not uh, talk about that later on because you have to choose things, okay? So uh, the other uh, thing is that now I would like to Look at this limit when alpha goes to infinity. Okay, so case of where you have, say, during each unit of time, you have a lot of collisions. Okay, so one thing which is very well known and uh, since actually long is uh, the case where you just remove this noise here. You start from the linearized Boltzmann equation. Okay, that I just write like this plus V grad X T for alpha times Lg. So actually the previous thing is not okay. Okay, so that's the, 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 the Boltzmann equation that you uh, get for the covariance, for instance. If you start from this uh, atomic model here with R spheres in this uh, low density uh, limit, assuming that mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus 1 is equal to alpha. Okay, so you get this, this one. Okay. Okay, and L now, I can maybe uh, write it uh, here. So L of G is something which is a bit complicated, but okay, I will explain. So that's M of V1, and then you have G of V prime 1, plus G of V prime minus G of V, minus G of V1, and then you have V minus V1, dot omega d omega dv1. Okay, so that's uh, linearized Boltzmann uh, operator, so I will try to explain. So the Boltzmann operator in general, okay, is this q of ff is almost the same, so it's f of v prime 1, f of v1 prime, minus f of v, f of v1. So that's the nonlinear Boltzmann e operator for R spheres. And I will try to explain all the terms. Okay, so you see that it's a bit complicated. And actually, this operator here express kind of jump process in the velocity space. Okay, so you see that it tells you that uh, how you will modify the distribution due to this to those, these, uh, collisions. Okay, so here, this is what is called the gain part, and you see that you will create somehow a new particles of velocity v just if you have two, pa two particles of velocity v prime and v, uh, v prime 1 which collide. So you have your v prime and your v prime 1 here. And when you have a collision of these two particles because of the uh, uh, collision law which ensures that both the energy and the momentum are conserved, you can uh, construct a pair like this of v and v1. Okay, so the only possibility to create a new particles of velocity v is to have a collision between two velocities like this, 
Okay? And here you see that omega is the deflection parameter. And now at this level of kinetic theory, it's not something that you can uh, measure on the, at, the, as at the microscopic level. It's just a random parameter. Okay, so omega is the deflection parameter is random. Okay, and so this tells you what is the probability that by collision of two particles with velocity v prime and v prime one, you will create a new particle of velocity v. Okay, so that you have just this jump. Okay, so that's the gain term. And now this is the loss term. Okay, you said that, okay, maybe a particle of velocity v, v will collide with another particle with velocity v1, and then they will be deflected. Okay, they will jump actually the other way, and you will have less particles of velocity v. Okay, so that's really what describe this, this, this jump process. And you see that this is what is called the collision cross-section. And it just gives you uh, the, the rate of this jump process. But you see that here you already see a bit of this, this uh, stochasticity, even at the level of the Boltzmann equation, because now omega is really random. Okay, so now it's, it's the expectation, so you don't see a noise here, but still you see that at the level of the law of large number, you, you already see a bit of randomness at the dynamical level, because now this, this deflection parameter is random. Okay, so that's the usual Boltzmann equation, uh, Boltzmann operator for the, for the collision operator. And now you see that if you look at f of v, which is just m of v times a small delta uh, fluctuation, then you see that the uh, linearization of this operator will give you this, uh, this operator here. Okay, so that's just a linearization of this, this guy here. Okay, so that's, th that's the linearized operator. And actually here when I uh, write this L, L is just minus V grad X plus L capital L. Okay. So, sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, but then uh, when you do the linearization, the alpha, how does it appear? Normally, the, the alpha is just if you if you uh, write with the mean field, it's always always this. Okay, the transport is not scaled by this uh, this this uh, transport is just transport. It's not scaled with this uh, low density parameter. Okay. So only this this one is scaled. You see that actually here you see that this quantity here is quadratic, mm -hmm. and so you see that you really have this 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 concept. Yeah. Okay. So that's why you get this density parameter in this only in this term. Okay. Okay. So now if you look at the, the limit when alpha goes to infinity in this equation, okay. So I can tell you uh, rapidly what happens. You see that so if you can prove some a priori bound for your g here. You see that, of course, this term will, will have uh, is, uh, a penalization, okay? And so you expect g to be in the kernel of L, okay? So when alpha goes to infinity, you expect that, uh, say, the limit, so here I will uh, call this g alpha, okay? So g alpha will converge to some g, so we assume that we have something like this. Then you have that L of G as equal to zero. And this tells you that G is actually a combination of collision invariants. So G will be uh, something like, so G of TXV will be quantity rho of TX plus U of TX dot V, sorry, plus theta of TX times Z squared minus D divided by two. Okay, and so that's the linearization of the density, the linearization of the bulk velocity, and the linearization of the temperature. Okay, so you see that if you are in a limit, in the fast relaxation limit, so that this uh, um, collision process is much faster than the transport, then you expect that you are indeed close to equilibrium. And here, for this fluctuation, this means that the G has to be of this form. Okay, so now you see that actually there are two kind of limits. So either you are really interested in this limit here, and then what you will see is actually uh, uh, the acoustic system for rho u and theta. Okay, so in this uh, regime, 
what you see is that rho u theta satisfy the acoustic equations. So here you see that you have no dissipation. Even though this equation is a bit dissipative, then in the limit you will not see any dissipation at the macroscopic level. But now if you rescale time and just look at um, parabolic scaling, so uh, you just look at this scaling, okay? So in this second, so in this new scaling, so in the parabolic scaling, what you obtain is that actually you will filter the acoustic wave, so you have this, this very fast oscillations, okay? But then you will see just the non-oscillating part, which is the incompressible part. Okay, which is in the kernel of the acoustic operator. So you get that the divergence of u is, has to be equal to zero, and the Boussinesq correlation that rho plus theta has to be a constant. Actually, yeah, it has to be zero, I think. Because you are in torus. And then you can prove that uh, u and theta, okay, they satisfy the Fourier and Stokes equation. Okay. Okay, and then, so here you see that in this, say, hyperbolic regime, here you have no dissipation. And so you don't expect that if you uh, add the noise here, you will, actually the noise will not be seen at the level of this, this, this acoustic approximation. But now if you look at this very, very long time, so diffusive time, if you think about broad motion, you see that you will see the diffusive limits by just rescaling time, just like here, okay? And then you see that, at this level here, you have the Fourier equation, so with the Laplacian, okay? So here, the equations are dissipative, and then if you add some noise here, by this same fluctuation dissipation theorem, you expect that this Fourier and Stokes equation have to uh, also be perturbed by a noise, which exactly compensates the dissipation, okay? So now if you add the noise here, then uh, you get here the fluctuating Stokes Fourier equation, and actually you can, uh, 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 write uh, a, a new theorem here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now if you look at uh, this, uh, so at this limit, so in the limit where mu epsilon goes to infinity, but you have that mu epsilon, epsilon d minus one, for alpha also goes to infinity with alpha epsilon, which is much smaller than log 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 mu epsilon. And now if you look at this uh, fluctuation field, so you really start from the particles, okay? And you look at the fluctuation field, so you just rescale time. I think this is, uh, so alpha is large. Okay, that's this. Then this, this guy, Okay, we'll converge to, actually, so of course you cannot really take this guy because this guy has a lot of components. It's uh, something which, so by duality, so it, it, it is defined on function of t, x, and v, but now you are not interested in this. So you have to project so somehow this, this uh, fluctuation field. So you have to project it on hydrodynamic fields. So converge to the solution of the fluctuating Navis the Stokes Fourier equation. Okay, so we have dt u equal Laplacian u. Plus, okay, the noise is a bit, um, because you have to use the direct projection. Okay, and then you have to take the diver, okay, the gradient. Okay, I, I will not write exactly what, what this guy is. Okay, something like this. So, du, Laplacian dt plus something like this. 
and this theta is so there is some viscosity here. Okay, and this what is important here is that uh, the incomplete constraint is is preserved. Okay, uh, that's like a gradient of uh, uh, um, a white noise. Okay, I will not. I will not detail all, uh, this part, but this is just to tell you that actually in this, in this, so close to equilibrium, you have really this wool picture. Okay, so you can really go from particles here to uh, the fluid equations, and even taking into account all these fluctuations. Okay, so that's um, the the first thing that I wanted to say. Okay, I'm already late. Uh, but what I would like to uh, do now is to explain the main ingredients for uh, this um, to essentially to prove this theorem here, so this central limit theorem. Okay, so of course part of these ingredients are known uh, since the work of Lanford, but I will uh, still spend a bit, bit of time to explain them because it's really uh, uh, the very uh, the very basic argument, and then I will try to um, focus on some very um, key arguments. Okay, so I will just give you right now the list of these arguments, and then I will uh, spend the three uh, next hours, so just one now, but uh, two on, I don't know, Wednesday or something like this, to explain uh, this, this important uh, new things. Okay? Yeah, sure. And so this projected on hyperdynamic fields, I think of an expansion and taking a few terms, or...? Not really. So here what we do, actually all this, this so this field actually is defined essentially by duality. So what you know is, is uh, its action on observable, so on, on test uh, uh, function. And now we say that instead of looking at any test function, we just look at test functions which are of the form, so typically uh, uh, phi of x times v square minus d plus 2 divided by 2. And this will give you uh, this uh, theta here. Okay? And for you, it's just uh, you look at test function which are of the form uh, function with, uh, which is diversion free uh, dot v. Okay? So instead of looking at all possible test functions, you just restrict your attention to some very specific test function for which essentially you prescribe the dependence with respect to V. Okay, but that's really a projection by duality. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a very nice question. So at the level of atomic level, it's clear to me what means the invariant, the Gibbs measure. Yeah. Uh, but here you still have on the fluid level, also we have some invariant measure on the fluid. So what does it mean, uh, the level of fluids? Ah. So you would like to, to construct the invariant measure for this guy here. Uh, you know how to do that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's something to, uh, what is the meaning uh, at the level of, if you have invariant measure for you, what is the meaning that uh, the level of velocities, I mean, uh, for the fluid, uh, you, you, what does it mean that the, if the initial velocities are distributed according to this measure, then later they stay... Uh, Actually, the, this means that, say, somehow this, this Laplacian here is, is strange, because this Laplacian here, Somehow, what you have to understand is that the energy at this level is the counterpart of the entropy at the level of the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so that's really, you really have to understand the energy as kind of information, uh, uh, information about the system. And what I say is that this, this part of the equation lost information just because, because, uh, uh, that's like the prime motion, you, you lost information looking at this uh, average. And what I say is that this part here comes from the fluctuation of all possible trajectories and actually it's not true that, uh, that so essentially that you recover, you just recover um, kind of stochastic reversibility with this guy. But I'm not able to construct the invert measure which is underlying the system because I have all this projection and I don't know how to project and to do all, the, all these kind of things. I, I don't know if this answers your question. Okay, so now we will have the list of tools. So I think the, 
The first part was the sixth problem of Hilbert, and the second part was, was the description of all these results. And now we have the mathematical tools. Okay, and as I told you, I, I, I will not describe all things because actually it's really um, it's a nightmare to prove this, this thing. But, um, but I, I would like to focus on some things which are, I think, uh, uh, rather intuitive. And so we can, uh, we can, I think you can have a good idea of what well, at, at least we, we have, say, uh, the idea of the global strategy, even though you probably after four hours, you will not be able to write all the details, but uh, OK, so uh, as I told you, the first ingredient is what is present in Landforce proof. And actually, I will spend the next hour explaining a bit this proof. OK, so so actually, in this uh, proof by Landford, there are really uh, two parts. OK, so one part is to, um, so the original idea is to write actually a kind of solution, actually the exact solution um, uh, of so the exact correlation function uh, using series expansion. OK, so essentially, but I think it's something which is really classical in all perturbation uh, methods. So essentially, you say that you don't really understand what happens, but you will essentially uh, write a Duhamel formula and then iterate the Duhamel formula. Okay, so that's uh, first important uh, ingredient with this series expansion. So that you obtain by Duhamel iteration. And so that's very classical in all these kind of problems. Actually, it doesn't work very well for the uh, for the case of uh, the mean field, at least not in all cases for the mean field. But here it's it's rather good. But of course, you see that as soon as you write this kind of of iteration and with that you write solution as some formal series, you see that you have a problem of convergence of the series, and that's why essentially uh, you can justify the Boltzmann equation only for very short times. Okay, so that's. So the, the fact that essentially the result is true only for a very short time is just due to this method. OK, so this, this is responsible for the short time. OK, because essentially the first term is like t, the second term is like t squared, then t uh, to the cube. And, and then you see that this kind of series, if the coefficients are not too bad, it will converge for t, which is small, but not for t large. OK, that's. OK, so that's very, um, uh, very classical. And then there is a second uh, argument, which maybe is not written exactly like this in, uh, in Landforce proof, but I think it's really uh, important, is that uh, it's a geometric argument. OK, so you would like to represent all this, this iteration of, uh, of Duhamel uh, by uh, trajectories, which are not trajectories of the system, but Pseudo trajectories. Okay, so that's really important. So it's the geometric representation of the dynamic. And actually, it's not of the, the real dynamics, but of the dynamics projected on some finite dimensional space. Okay, so. Projected on. Finite dimensional spaces. Okay, and so here we'll have the notion of pseudo trajectories. And I will spend a bit of time explaining these pseudo trajectories. But then we will see that what is important here, so what you have to uh, remember for, um, for the rest of, of these uh, lectures is that. Uh, um, here you will see that the, the kind of convergence, say, the notion of convergence that you have, once again, is very different from mean field. So in the case of mean field, what you obtain is that essentially all trajectories will be close to each other. Okay? You can modify a bit the position of one particle, etc. But it's very stable in the sense that all trajectories are close to each other. Here it's different. So 
the, 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 the say in general the trajectories are close to each other but sometimes okay trajectories may diverge very rapidly okay so that's what we will call recollision so sometimes it may happen that trajectories are quite far from each other. And so you see that the notion of convergence is really different because you don't expect the, the empirical measure to, to converge for all initial data. What you expect is that it will converge in probability. So with um, almost probability one, all the trajectories will, be, um, will have a nice behavior. But say for this, this uh, bad set of initial data, then you have something else. Okay, so that's really different from mean field, and you can really see this at the level of soil trajectories. So you see that here. So that's, so that's important for the notion of convergence. Say the empirical measure. is well behaved for almost all initial data. Actually, actually it's not almost all, say for a set of initial data um, of probability um, converging to one. And actually, it's very important because then you will see that all the fluctuation, all the correlation, everything else will be encoded in this bad set, which is the complement of this set here. Okay, so that's really important but because the fluctuations are encoded in the small complement. And you see that it's very, um, it's, it's kind of consistent with the fact that I told you that in the case of mean field, essentially uh, the small complement is just empty and then you, you don't have any fluctuation. Okay, that's really different. Okay, so even though you have, can have the impression that, okay, that's more or less the same, you will see that actually it's very different. And maybe I should also say that, say, in the mean field, you retrieve this kind of behavior if you just look at the next order correction. Okay, so at the, at the main order, you don't see these kind of things, but if you go to the next order correction, then you see something like this, with dissipation and fluctuation and all this kind of behavior. Okay, so that's the first, the really the starting point is this, this strategy by Lanford. Okay. Okay, then there, there is another uh, second ar argument, okay, which is, um, which I, I will try to explain uh, next time, which is um, the time sampling, okay, so and actually it's related to uh, this, this thing here, so what I say is that, okay, maybe, say, in general, everything is nice and I should be close to the Boltzmann dynamics. And then it's perfect. I'm happy with that. Okay. But now you see that there can be a pathological behavior. And the first way you see this kind of pathological behavior is that you can have a lot of collisions and then that's responsible for this short time limitation. Okay. So that's the first thing that you would like to avoid. And then the other thing is that uh, this, uh, you have this strange recollision or say um, strange pathological trajectories and you would like also to avoid this kind of things as you know that you will not have any convergence. Okay, so essentially you have two obstructions to have a long time convergence in Landford proof. The first one is that you can have a lot of collisions and then you have uh, very high iterations of the dual formula and then it's very bad because Okay, these terms can be uh, very um, large. And the other thing is that maybe you have this kind of uh, bad uh, behavior here, and then uh, it's just wrong that you have the convergence. Okay, so the idea is uh, that if you would like to 
somehow improve land force proof, then you have to avoid this kind of behaviors. Okay, so now what we will do is just to say, okay, I would like to have the conversion on a very big time here, say zero, here I have theta, and I would have to have, and say Landford tells me that I have conversion on this very small interval here. So, okay, now what I will, uh, what I will do, okay, say Landford is, say that's uh, Landford time, okay, but I, uh, somehow if you j go until Landford time, it's too late, okay, it's already, so you, can, you cannot win with this strategy here. So what we uh, will be doing is just to uh, somehow restrict time to have very, very small time intervals here. So these very small time intervals, they are, say, not exactly microscopic times. So microscopic times would be the, the time which, which is uh, just uh, invariant by the dynamics. So if you take time of the order of epsilon as the size of the particles is epsilon, you will see just always the same by dilation. Okay, so you will take a time delta here, which is a bit bigger than epsilon, but say of the same order as epsilon. Okay, and then each time you will uh, reach this time, this, this small, a time interval, you will just check whether you have a pathological thing, okay? Then if you have a pathological thing, then you stop. And you just iterate when everything is nice. Okay, so, so look at very uh, small time intervals and iterate only if everything is nice, which is a very, uh, very uh, rigorous mathematical statement. I think with this, you can do the proof by yourself. Okay, so actually, you see that you have two, two types of pathological behaviors. So one is uh, the, the big, big uh, number of collisions, okay? And the other one is this, uh, this, uh, this what we will call recollisions. Okay, so essentially what you do is that um, uh, at each time delta here, you remove trajectories with recollision. And we will see that in terms of graphs, because everything here will be a very, uh, uh, you have a lot of combinatorics here, and it, in terms of graphs, tells you that you have something which is non-minimally connected, so you have loops and things like this. Uh, so with, I would call this, loops and cycles, and I will explain this. So at each time R delta, okay, and say, actually you need a double sampling, you need a time which is a bit bigger, which is tau, which is small, really small uh, compared to one, so this is just a bit bigger than epsilon, and you have tau, which is still bigger, and then you have one, okay? And you remove trajectories with too many collisions, with actually super exponential uh, collision process. Collision, so growth or collisions, okay? At each time, tau. So I will uh, come back on this, but you see that really the idea is that with this sampling, you just say, uh, remove, discard all possible things which are really bad and that somehow prevent the convergence here. Okay, so, and this, this actually, this argument was already present in, in, uh, in the case of uh, quantum, uh, limits, I think that's really something which is important in the paper by Ardush and Yao. And actually it's, it was also present in uh, uh, our first paper in this for a long time in the case of just one particle uh, going to the Brownian motion. Okay, so uh, it was a paper with uh, uh, Thierry and Isabelle. Okay, but that, that's really uh, one important thing. But of course, you cannot use this, this thing without 
saying what you will do with the remainders. Okay, because here you generate a lot of remainders each time that you stop the iteration. You see, you stop uh, in the middle of nowhere. You can stop here. Okay, but then uh, what do you do with this 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 remainder? Okay, and so um, I think one really um, nice new argument that uh, we used in to prove this theorem is, uh, and that's the reason why we really use the fact to be close to equilibrium is that we can really use the invariant measure to discard all this bad. Uh, uh, so you see that with, with this sampling, what we are able to do is to localize the problem. Okay, so until here, since you don't uh, stop the iteration, until here, everything is nice. And now you know that uh, the bad thing happens here. Okay, so here with this, this sampling, what you are able to do is to localize The bad, the bad behavior in time. Okay, and so now the, the, the next argument, which is really important and which really use the invert measure, uh, is kind of weak convergence method. So you see that it's really different from Lanford. Lanford is really a strong convergence method. You write a series expansion for your correlation function. Okay, so everything is, is this is an exact formula, and then you prove that each term will converge to something. And so in the end, what you have is a really a strong convergence of a norm. Okay, you can control the, the remainder between uh, the asymptotic and uh, and the original correlation function. So it's really so here it's different. We will really use the fact that we compute expectation under the invert measure. Okay, so here we uh, look at uh, moments. So moments meaning that you have expectation of some observables. Um, under the invert measure. And now the very nice thing is that under the invert measure, you can say that this guy, so only the problem here, will happen with uh, essentially uh, zero probability, at least with negligible probability. Okay, so what you are able to do is to localize the bad behavior, and then with the invert measure, what we will be able to do with this, this moment is actually to decouple all times. Okay, so what happens here at time zero, what happens here at time theta, I don't know, and what happens here. And just because of this contribution here, it will be negligible. Okay, so what is really important is that um, remainders can be estimated using time decoupling. Okay, so of course I will essentially spend one hour on these two things. Of course they, they go uh, together, but uh, I think it's important for you to have already this intuition that what is really uh, different is that you don't try to have an exact representation of the correlation function at this stage here. You just try to have, say, uh, the expectation of some moments at different times, okay? So you take just the fluctuation field at different times that you test against test function. So you have these observables here. And then you say, okay, but here there is something that essentially never happens. And so that's, I can just forget, say the contribution to the expectation will be essentially zero. And for the second method, you need to be still close to equilibrium or you can hope to use it in more general situations? So <laughs> uh, I hope to use it, uh, but I'm I'm very optimistic, you know. But in so, the but <laughs> so I so what I hope is that actually we can do things like this, also far from equilibrium using the entropy. Okay, so here you see that essentially what we are using are moments. So. Uh, because because what is good is that wha when you are close to equilibrium and you look at the fluctuation field, essentially what you, are, you can control is any LP, so any uh, moment of order P of the fluctuation field. Okay, just by order inequality and then it's fine. Okay. 
And so my hope, but uh, maybe uh, I'm the only one <laughs> hoping that it's possible, uh, is that essentially um, we should be able to do the same thing using the fact that actually when you start even in this, this, this case where you're far from equilibrium, then you see that of course you control, uh, uh, so usually in Landford proof you use some weighted L infinity estimate on, on the, and this cannot be uh, uh, propagated for further time, but one thing which is propagated is the entropy. Okay, the entropy is actually at the level of the microscopic uh, system, it's something which is just preserved. It's a conserved quantity. And my hope is that somehow it tells you that you are not so far from, so in some sense, you are still close to equilibrium, and then if you have something which is really, really pat pathological, this cannot happen. But okay, that's like science fiction. Okay, so that's, and you have to be very, very optimistic to think that such a thing can, um, can be true, but okay. It's important to, have a, to dream a little bit. <laughs> Okay, and then the last argument that I would like to um, to show you, and I, I don't know whether I will have a lot of time to, to do this kind of thing, but I think it's really something which is nice and actually which, which gives you a very uh, complete statistical picture of all these things here, okay, which is um, uh, the, the, the question of dynamical clusters. Okay, and um, okay, so um, so this dynamical clusters is a way, a systematic way of classifying all correction to so you see that in, in this 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 um, Boltzmann approximation, so even in the in the general case here, what you expect is that so this Boltzmann equation is is um, uh, the law of large number, essentially, and you see that what is important is that, say, this equation, what, what it tells you is that the probability of having a collision between two particles, so normally, of, of course, it depends on the probability, joint probability of having two particles with velocity v prime and v prime one, but now it's like the product, okay? So uh, the, 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 the Boltzmann approximation is to tell you that es essentially everything is chaotic in the sense of statistical physics, meaning that all particles will remain independent forever. Okay, so that's really what is important is the Boltzmann approximation. Okay, what is actually in Boltzmann theory is really an assumption, is that you have this independence, okay, which is also called chaos. Okay, and now wha what I say is that with dynamical cluster, actually, we will be able to classify all deviations with respect to this chaos. Okay, so this is this gives you a systematic way. of describing and classifying uh, the deviations from cows. So here in the in the case of where you're close to equilibrium because you expect essentially what you expect is, is essentially is that in the end you will end up with something which is Gaussian and so of course you are interested only in in say in the just correlation with two points okay so because else all the other terms will be uh, really really small correction and actually in the limit they will completely disappear okay so in this case this is you don't really need completely this, this complete uh, classification here of uh, what we call also cumulants. But uh, actually it's a very, very powerful method and it tells you that in this, this, uh, in this general case, far from equilibrium, you can, uh, so you have this, this, uh, this uh, law of large number, then you have the central limit theorem to describe the, the small fluctuations, and then you can actually even reach a large deviation principle. Okay, so if you really uh, uh, use this, this, this uh, powerful method here with the classification of all possible clusters of all orders, then you end up with a large deviation. So th this is just a remark. This actually provides 
a large deviation result out of equilibrium. So here, to prove this, this, uh, this, um, this theorem here on the central limit theorem, we will not really use uh, this, all this classification, but still we will need a bit of this. When you are interested not only in the covariance, but in higher order moments, so if you are really interested uh, in proving that asymptotically you have a Gaussian process, so that you have Vick's rule, then you need at some point to really use this, this uh, dynamical clusters. Okay, so here it will be useful to prove the rule. So you can say about the rule, you don't need to look at correlation of order three and four, but actually here, so at some intermediate time scale, you really need to have a more precise description in order to be able to uh, iterate the whole thing. Okay, so we need a precise uh, description at intermediate time scale. So typically, uh, the intermediate time scale is the, t the time scale tau here to be able to do the whole iteration. So that will be the program for the last hour and I'm not sure that I will have a lot of time to do it because I'm already quite late. So that's okay, we will see. Okay, so that's uh, really all the ingredients that uh, somehow you need to uh, use to prove this theorem and then you, you need a lot of uh, technical things and so the technical things are a lot of combinatorics, okay, a lot of geometry and you know this, this bad geometry uh, like uh, 3D geometry where you have to compute sets and intersection of cylinders and things like this. So it's not really, and but I promise that I will not tell you anything about that. Okay, so, the, the <laughs> uh, so of course I'm just um, putting everything under the carpet, but okay. So uh, now in the remaining time, what I would like to do is really to come back on this, uh, on this, um, uh, Landford thing because I, I think it's really important for you to have to have this um, this say basic elements to understand the, the rest of the proof. Okay, so I'm sorry for those of you who already know all this Landford thing very well. Um, okay, you we, uh, you will lose uh, half an hour or you can uh, maybe just go uh <laughs> outside right now. <laughs> but uh, I, I really need to um, to take a bit of time to explain this. Okay, so now that's, it was supposed to be at the beginning of uh, the second hour. Did you see that? I just have half an hour. Okay, so. So uh, I have already erased uh, what, what was written about Landford proof, but so if you have to um, remember one idea is really that what you are doing in, in Landford proof is really to project the dynamics on finite dimensional um, uh, finite dimensional space, okay? And that's uh, the, 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 the tool to do that is the correlation function, okay? So you project, essentially you have your distribution, you see that your uh, initial measure live in a space which is infinite dimensional because you do not fix in advance the number of particles so it can be as large as you want okay but then you you project everything so you project this this measure on finite dimensional space okay so that's what you do when you introduce a correlation function Okay, so essentially the correlation function, what it uh, does for you is to compute, if you uh, compute uh, the expectation of um, 
of 1 over mu epsilon to the p times the sum for some indices which are all different. So, so they are different. Okay. I will not uh, write this anymore. Of a function, say, uh, capital H, which has p indices, and then you take c1 of t, cip of t. Okay, so that's the expectation under the initial measure. Okay, and so now what you are doing is, so you have your initial measure, then you uh, pick p, uh, p points, okay, and of course you take any p points among all the particles, and then you look at uh, the trajectories of this p point, and then you look at the configuration of this p point at time t, okay? And so of course this is a function which depends on t now, okay? You start with your, all your points, and then you pick uh, p points at time t, and you look at you test this with a function h here, which is very smooth, very integrable, so a very nice function. Okay, and then this will be, by definition, it will be uh, the integral of w p, which depends on z, and on z p, time h p of z p p z p. Okay, well, capital z p is just uh, Z1, Zp. Okay, so that tells you what is the distribution at uh, time t of these p variables. Okay, so here you see that you have really this projection, okay, because now I, I just look at observables which depend on the finite number of variables. Can you use capital F notation or use W? No, maybe F would be better, yeah. Okay, and now, okay, I will not do this computation, but if you start from uh, this art sphere dynamics, so I just recall that, that you have that dx i divided by d t just equal to vi, and that dvi divided by d t is equal to zero until, so as long as xi minus xj is bigger than epsilon for any j, from i plus the collision low. Then you can write the equation for this fp here, which is exact. Okay, Th that's something that's. And so for this, the grand canonical setting is, is very nice because you don't have small correction. In the canonical setting, you have small correction, which are due to the fact that the, the number of particles, the total number of particles is fixed. And so you have some small deviation, which are just due to this. But in the, canon the grand canonical setting, you have a very nice equation, which tells you that dfp times, so the sum of vi grad xi fp. So as you here, you recognize the transport part of the equation. So that's just the translation of these two equations here. Okay, so if, I've, if I put uh, an external force or something like this, I would just change the transport here by adding another term in this Louisville part of the equation. Okay, and then I have another part which comes from the fact that maybe I will eat the boundary of the, uh, of the, uh, of the phase space and then I will have a collision. Okay, so now this term here comes from Green's formula. Okay, and it corresponds to uh, uh, the boundary term, boundary of d epsilon p. Okay, when you have okay, that's that not really exactly the boundary of okay, p plus one, p plus one. Okay, and then here what you have is something like f the sum from i equal one to p, and then you see that each one of these particles may collide with another particle, okay? And so you have an integral over xi minus say, xp plus 1 is equal to epsilon, okay? And then you have fp plus 1 
of, so you have uh, the zp, okay, so then you have x, uh, okay. Okay, um, okay, and then, and then, then the, the, the right thing to, to be done, okay, is that, and then of course you, are, you see that you have also, the, this x plus one can be any of the remaining particles, okay? So essentially what I would like to explain is that you have a factor epsilon to d minus one which comes from this boundary here, okay? And you have a factor mu epsilon which comes from the choice of this particle number, this particle number labeled p plus, p plus one among all particles. Okay, so this tells you that you have a factor here which is mu epsilon times epsilon to d minus one. And so, so here you will see uh, the inverse mean free pass. Okay, so now I will just uh, just um, uh, reparameterize this this boundary here, and so I end up with f p plus one of okay I have this um, this uh, z p and then I have x i plus epsilon omega so this is a parameterization of the boundary and then I have v i v p plus one sorry and I have a d v p plus one uh, I have the vi minus v per plus one dot omega d v per plus one d omega. Okay, so that is just the parameterization of the boundary. And then uh, the, the usual thing that you do is to um, um, split this term into uh, two um, parts depending on the sign of this guy. Okay, so you see that this omega is just xi minus x plus one, and according to the sign, you will have some particles which are about to collide or wh wh which have just collided. Okay, so you split this term in, in two terms. So split the integral according to the sign. of this quantity here. And then you write everything in terms of pre-collision also, in terms of particles which are about to collide. Okay, because if you think of, of just writing the dynamics, the way you are doing things is to prescribe the state of the particles after the collision in terms of the state before the collision and not the uh, reverse thing. Okay, so you decide here that you will just change variables here and to write everything in terms of pre-collisional variables. And then you get a form which is very similar to the Boltzmann equation, where you have a gain term and a loss term. The only thing is that it's not factorized. Here you see that you have fp plus one, and here you have fp. And so you, have, you don't have a closed system. Okay, but, but you really get something which is uh, close to the, um, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Boltzmann equation. Okay, so I will not rewrite this, but essentially you have alpha, Okay, maybe I should I should do it. Okay, so a sum, and then you have f p plus one. So I just write the two arguments which are important. So you have x i v prime i, x i plus epsilon omega v p plus one prime. Okay, so that's the case where this term here was uh, uh, positive. Okay, and then minus uh, fp plus 1 xi vi xi plus epsilon omega vp uh, plus 1. Okay, and then you change the sign here of omega and then you get this and then you get the positive part of this guy. In, in this computation we use that the number of particles is random or we don't use Yes. If, if the number of particles is not random, here you see that, for instance, if you look at uh, the, the case of p particles, then instead of having mu epsilon here, you have n minus p. And so you see you have a bit of correlation, which is due to the fact that now the number, of course, the total number of particles is fixed, and so the possible other particles are just n minus p. And so this kind of small errors are just accumulating. And so at some point it's, so if you would like, just to write the Boltzmann equation, it's not a problem because, okay, you have essentially one time this error. But if you would like to write large deviation, then it's just uh, impossible to deal with this small error accumulating. Yeah, so uh, grand canonical is much better because here it's just uh, exact. 
Okay, so that's the oh, okay. That's just to tell you how you start with this projection. So I think it's really important that the first um, step in uh, land force proof is this projection on finite dimensional space. And you see that now the idea in the proof of Landford is really to prove that this FP, of course it depends on the epsilon, will converge to something. And it's kind of strong convergence of F epsilon P. Okay, so let me explain how it works. But you see that really it's strong convergence in the sense that you will project and then prove some strong convergence on this, on this projection. Excuse me, uh, a short question. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so, so in the equation we have we have the I mean we have one of the particles scattering with one particles that are not described by the, I mean that are not the one plus. Yeah. P. What is about the collisions among? Yeah. So that's really important. You're right. Thank you for the the remark. So this equation now it's 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 uh, is defined on d epsilon p. Meaning that if at some point two particles are colliding, then you, you have the still have a boundary condition for this function that uh, they will be reflected. So that's really important, you're right, that this transport here also it seems to be the same as in the Boltzmann equation, it's not the same, because when you have two particles here among the, the p which are already uh, fixed, that uh, see each other, then you have a collision. Which is exactly the difference with the Boltzmann equation, where if they are in the p uh, particles here, they will just uh, cross each other. So that's really the important point, actually. Uh, so I will go uh, back on this later on, but uh, you're right that it's really important to say this. Okay, so now let me. Uh Sorry, I just have a question. Yeah. So presumably the f should be symmetric? Yeah, it's symmetric with respect to the p argument. But why do you need to sum over i then? Here? Yeah, no, in the right hand side. Here, uh, because uh, still it's symmetric, but uh, you have collision on all particles. Okay. So because, because you have the sum here, it will stay symmetric. But of course you have to take into account collision with all particles. Because then you see that if you look at the sequence of collisions, uh, you can have shocks with different particles. So that's really important to... to so where I really use the symmetry is that when I multiply by this mu epsilon. Normally it should be uh, uh, the sum over all possible uh, pair of particles, one which is already in these p particles and one of the remainder. But I say that all the particles of the remainder, they are symmetric. That's really important. So now in the, in the proof, there are two steps. OK, so uh, you see that, OK, I will just uh, forget about the, uh, the, the, the precise formula for the collision operator because it's, very, it's not very nice. You see that it's an integral over an, an hypersurface, OK, which is of co-dimension 1. But you see that in the limit, when epsilon goes to 0, it's actually of co-dimension d, so it's really awful. So I will just forget about that. OK, and just tell you how you would like to do, do things. And then you see that there is a bit of, uh, of uh, functional analysis to be done here to understand what it means to write what I will write. OK, so essentially what you end up with is something like dt plus this, say, I call capital Vx plus xp. So that's the short notation for this thing. Fp equal a collision operator which actually act on fp plus 1. Okay, And now you see that I have a sum here. So this, if I forget about the size of the velocities, as you see that the velocities are, not, are unbounded. So this is not bounded, but I will forget about that. I will forget about the integrals, about the trace, about everything. But you see that essentially what, what this guy uh, is doing is just to multiply. It's just like a multiplication by p. Of course, it's you see that it's a rough, rough estimate, but I think it's it's good to understand how um, things uh, goes. So now, what I say, I say I would like to represent this this thing, and I say okay, I will just do this two m iteration. Okay, okay, it will be an exact formula. Maybe it's not very nice, but at least it's an exact formula. Okay, so I say that f p at time t. So the first iteration is to say that 
I will transport, so I will denote by sp the transport of this guy. So it's sp of t by 2 fp of 0. Okay, so that's the case where I just forget about the right hand side. I just apply the transport, then plus the integral from 0 to t of alpha. Then I have the transport of t minus, say, uh, t. So probably I will be, I would say tp, but I'm not sure that's the. And then I have c p p plus 1. And then I have f p plus 1 of s. OK, for the moment I would just call this s. OK, but then uh, I'm not really happy because now I have this f plus 1, p plus 1. OK, so I just uh, redo the thing. And then uh, if I do this uh, an infinite number of times, I end up with something like this. So this will be the sum from, uh, say, uh, I will call this uh, n, call 0 to plus infinity of an operator that I will call q of p, p plus n of t of f p plus n of 0. OK, and this guy is just a sequence of, so I just do sp of, say, t, t uh, um, so I'm sure that I will not take the, the right things, but OK. t p plus 1. OK, probably it's t minus t plus 1. Uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, it will not be good, but uh, OK. Let's call it t p. And c p p plus 1. OK, I think it's p plus 1. OK, we will see. Then I just transport p plus 2, etc. c p. Uh, p plus n, and then I have s p plus n of uh, t minus the sum of all other types. OK, so I transport, then I add a new particle, then I transport, then I add a new particle, and so on. OK? OK, and then I have a big, big integral here over the simplex. p plus n. OK? OK, so now if I just uh, try to evaluate the size of this guy, OK, you just remember that here is just like the multiplication by p. OK? And this now you have a simplex in time, and so this will be like uh, uh, t to the power uh, p plus, OK, t to the power n divided by factorial n. OK, so the, the size of this simplex here is like t, t to the n divided by factorial n. And then this guy, OK, the transport is a very nice operator which essentially conserves all reasonable functional spaces that you can imagine. OK, so you just say that it's just multiplication by 1, and then I multiply by p plus 1 until p plus n. And so you see that, OK, this, this is not, say, up to a factor 2 to the, uh, to the power, I don't remember, p plus n, something like this. You recognize here it's just like factorial n. Okay, so these two guys here, up to something which is a geometric factor, they are uh, essentially of the same size. And then you see that in order that you can sum everything, you need that t is, say, smaller, much smaller than 1. OK, so that's, that's the reason why you have this short time restriction, is that you just do that, and then you end up with something which is convergence only for short time. OK, so that's the first, the first And so just to um, um, go back to what I tell you about the sampling and so on, you see that the problem here is that you cannot really um, discard the fact that you have a lot of collision. Of course, you don't expect to have so many collisions, okay, because essentially you expect this, the, this branching process to, uh, to be like uh, a very uh, nice branching process with a rate which is given here. So it should be like exponential, okay, so it should not be uh, growing like crazy. But, but say with this kind of, with this kind of, of um, with this kind of estimate, you don't see this, this, this uh, exponential bound. And you see that it's even worse because 
you see that these uh, collision operators, uh, they have actually a gain part and a loss part. And of course, when you are at equilibrium, both terms will just compensate. But here, I just forget that I have a minus sign. Okay, so that's very, very uh, bad. Okay, but say we don't have any, any alternative to do that. Okay, so that's bad because of, okay, so that's bad. You have uh, no control on the growth. which we expect, okay? Actually, we expect something like an exponential growth and not super exponential and uh, no compensation between gain and loss terms. And that's really bad because you see that even at equilibrium, if you look at the land force proof, you see that even at equilibrium, you get the conversions for a very short time. Of course, then uh, as everything is constant, then you can redo it. But you see that it's very, very uh, bad. Okay, and then you have the second argument, and I think I still have five minutes to, oh, a bit more, seven minutes to explain the second argument. Can, you, can I just ask, I mean, when you say very short time, can you make that a bit more quantitative? Is it up to a small constant, like a Lamport's proof, or? but constant times? No, it's, so it tells you that if, if you have this parameter alpha, you get a time which is like one over alpha, one, one fifth of one divided by five alpha or something like this. So it's, it's like, it's really uh, the proof of Lanford. And so it tells you that actually you have less than one collision per particle in average. Of course, you still have a lot of collision because you have a lot of particles, but in average, you have less than one collision per particle. So it's really bad. And, and of course, with less than one collision per particle, you have no chance to reach a fast relaxation. That's because you need a lot of... Okay, so that's the, say, the setting to have the estimate. And then, and then you have the, uh, the second argument in land force proof is this geometric thing. So now uh, I go back to this uh, Q operator here, and I just try to understand what, what I'm doing, okay? And then we will see that, that uh, actually with a geometric interpretation of this, it's not very difficult to, uh, to, to prove the convergence, okay? Of course, once everything is, once the series is absolutely convergent, you just need to look at one term and prove that each elementary term is converging and then you are fine. Okay, so you start with this. So you have you you would like to look at the distribution of p points like this. Okay, so that's p particles at time t. And so what are you doing? You 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 first transport these particles during a time uh, t p plus one. So that's very bad actually, but okay. Okay, so I have a transport like this. Until at some point, you see that I have collision of one of these particles with another particle. Okay, so now if I, I would like to know the history of these particles, then I need to, so this, this is time p plus 1. At this time p plus 1, I add a new particle here. Okay, and of course I have to prescribe, so I have to prescribe first of all the, uh, the colliding particle here. Okay, so what I have to prescribe. So here you have a bit of combinatorics because you have to understand the, the collision tree. Okay, so the, the, the label here. So I need to put the A uh, P plus one. Okay, so that's the label of the colliding particle. So this is just an integer between 1 and p, okay? But then I uh, also have to prescribe this time here for the, the tp plus 1. I need to, under the, to prescribe the velocity of this particle here and also the, uh, the, the impact parameter. Okay, so I have to prescribe this guy, the vp plus 1 and the omega p plus 1. Okay, so you see that now I'm not really... Uh, um, 
describing a, a real trajectory of particles because I really start from something which is a projection here. And so now what I'm describing is backward dynamics, but this is not a real trajectory because I add particles and some parameters here are just integration parameters. Okay, so that's not a real trajectory, but still it's like a dynamics. Okay, so it's not, not a real trajectory. Just because of the projection. But still it's dynamics. So we will call it a pseudo trajectory. Okay, so now I do that. So now I have this p plus one. Now I type p plus two. I have another collision like this, and like this, like this. Okay, and then uh, okay, and then you do that until uh, time zero. So at time zero, you have your n plus p particles. And actually, you have a representation here where I say that somehow I can represent fp of t as an average over all possible histories. So a possible history is the first thing that I have to, to prescribe is n, the total number of branching. But now, if I look just at, at one elementary term, it is fixed. Okay. And then I have to prescribe this, this collision tree and all these parameters for p, for, from p plus 1 to p plus n. Okay? So now I have big average over many things, but of course what is very good is that I know the probability of this configuration at time 0, because at time 0 I know everything. Okay? So this is just a weighted average over the initial configuration. So of course this is very complicated and I'm not very it's not much better than, than the equation at the beginning. So what I have to do now is to compare this with what I expect to be the limit, so the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And that's exactly the point uh, uh, that you mentioned before. So in the case of the Boltzmann equation, you have the same kind of representation. Okay? So for the Boltzmann equation. You have a similar representation with, of course, there are some small uh, differences. Okay, so the first difference is that when you add a particle, here you see that particles have a size, so you see that they are at a distance which is of the order of epsilon. Okay, so you have no spatial shift when you are looking at the Boltzmann equation. But you see that, okay, as n now is finite, if you have a spatial shift of, of size epsilon, each time you have a collision in the end, maybe you are at distance n times epsilon, but if you have a nice, a nice initial data here, then you are fine. Okay? Then you have a second uh, problem, which is not really a geometrical problem, but which is e here, uh, uh, the, um, the initial distribution here. Of course, because of the exclusion, it depends a little bit on epsilon. Okay? So you have the exclusion in the uh, initial, say you have no exclusion in the initial data. So it's a bit different. You have exact factorization for the Boltzmann equation uh, in the limit, but it's not the case uh, uh, for fixed epsilon. And then there is this very bad thing, which is really different, and this, this is what is complicated, is that in the Boltzmann case, maybe you see, so if, if I'm not cheating too much, and these two particles here, they will just collide. Okay? Because just say they go straight and after a while they just collide. So of course, in dimension uh, with this kind of representation on the blackboard, uh, all the particles will collide, but, but, but say in principle, because of the scaling, okay, the, the gaze is really dilute, and this kind of event will happen with negligible probability. Okay? So what is really, really bad is what we call recollisions. So when two particles which are already, so not, not a new created particle, but two particles which are already in the, in the system will collide. Okay? So that's really, really bad because then you see that the Boltzmann equation, uh, this, this, they will be uh, deflected, something like this. 
while in the Boltzmann equation, they just cross each other and they go straight, and then the trajectories will be really far from each other. Okay, so here you see that this collision, then you cannot compare, you have no coupling between the trajectories. No coupling. And so what you have to prove is that this will happen with a very small probability. Okay, so you prove that you have a coupling for almost all parameters, okay, so for for a, a, a set of parameters of, of probability almost one, you get the coupling between the two trajectories, and sometimes there is something which is bad. Okay? So that's not a problem at the level of the law of large numbers, because you don't care. It's just a small contribution. So that's really important, because so, uh, they do not contribute uh, to the limit. Uh, uh, at the level of the law of large numbers. But of course, this free collision will be really important when you are interested in the fluctuation. Actually, the noise will typically come from this, this free collision. So it will be really important in the sequel. But in Lanford proof, they are just bad. And you just throw, um, throw them away. Okay? So that's really important. And this is really something that you have to uh, keep in mind is this representation of, of the solution with these sort of trajectories. Because then we will really play with this so that uh, these dynamical clusters, actually, in statistical physics, in equilibrium statistical physics, what you are doing is just clusters of, the, of points like this. And now we will do clusters of these this big trajectories, these big dyna dynamical uh, things. And so that's really important to have this in mind, that we can represent everything by this, this, uh, this um, uh, geometric picture. Okay, I think it's time. Yeah, I'm already late, sorry. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>